Thanks, Paul, and welcome to Q&A live from Mackay in North Queensland. This is a key battleground for the next election. We've gathered a very enthusiastic audience at the Mackay Entertainment Centre. I'm Tony Jones. Thank you very much. Now, here to answer your questions, the leader of the Catter Australia Party and member for Kennedy, Bob Catter. The only Labor MP in Northern Queensland, Cathy O'Toole. One Nation leader and Senator Pauline Hanson. Prominent Nationals backbencher, George Christensen. And returning Green Senator, Larissa Waters. So please welcome our panel. Thank you. We have five politicians on the panel tonight, so we've asked them to keep their answers to under one minute, so we can get through as many questions as possible. We'll see if that works. Q&A is live in Eastern Australia on ABC TV, iView and News Radio. Later, we'll talk climate, coal and crocodiles. Uh, but in a week of political chaos, let's go to our first question, which logically enough is on that subject, comes from Nathan Jorgensen. Hi. I've been a long-time Labor supporter. However, with the last federal election, my vote was for the coalition government in hopes of stability and real leadership. Unfortunately, the party seems too concerned about opinion polls and too afraid to implement real policy reform in favour of this glorified, self-centred popularity contest. With the latest news poll showing a 44 to 56 preference to Labor, is there any hope for any modern government to lead this country with real policy reform without the fear of retribution from within their own party. Paul, then I'll start with you. Uh, glorified self-centred popularity contest. Is that how last week looked? I have you? got no leadership challenges, and I put that on the table right here and now. So, <laughs> so I suggest vote One Nation. No problems. Let me ask you this. Were you relieved the Liberals went for Scott Morrison and not Peter Dutton? Because you did make the point uh, during the week that he would have been a, a, a much harder contest in Queensland for you. Um, no, I didn't say it would be a much harder contest for us in Queensland, not at all. I think the people were over Malcolm Turnbull, that was quite evident in the polls that the Liberal Party were, were showing. And I think because of the, the rise of One Nation, support for One Nation, the LNP realised that they, they were losing votes to One Nation and the Labor as well. And that was evident in Longman. So they were actually um, frightened of losing their seats. So this is all about the pollies protecting their own seats, next election, and they're frightened of losing it. So, so politically, strategically, do you reckon they made a mistake going for Dutton over Morrison? I'm not going to give them any Going hints. for Morrison over I'm Dutton, not, I'm, I'm not going to tell them what to do. <laughs> I thought you already done that. George, what do you say? Well, I think that it's fair to say that uh, last week was pretty bloody messy. Uh, no one's proud of it. Uh, and I think that... Um, you know, now we just move on as a government. There was an element, I've got to say, when I moved around the north here, um, whether it's up to Townsville or down to Mackay in between, people were telling me that they really had lost uh, a lot of confidence in Malcolm Turnbull, um, that they thought he wasn't listening. Um, and, and I guess that uh, once you've got to that level, something has to be done. Um, it was done. Now we need to unify and move on and just deliver on the things that matter, principally lowering power prices and the drought, and I'm glad to see that they're the two things that PM ScoMo is focused on. What about the question that was asked there? Is there hope for a government to lead this country with real policy reform without fear of retribution from within the ranks? So we know the conservative insurgency is still there. Tony Abbott's not leaving, and many of his cohort are actually in the ministry. But what, 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 what do you mean by reform? I mean, there's good reform and there's bad reform. And, uh, you know, reform that's going to push up power prices... I don't know there's too many people that are actually going to agree with that. So uh, I'm not for reform that's going to push up power prices, as I suspect the NEG was going to do, um, because it focused on the wrong thing. It focused on the Paris Agreement rather than on lowering prices. So uh, I make no apologies for actually opposing that, uh, that policy. Um, but yes, reform can be delivered, um, but it's got to be the right kind of reform. Larissa, how does this look to you? You're about to come back into the Senate after an interregnum uh, due to a citizenship issue. Yeah, look, what a time to be returning to politics. And Nathan, thank you for your question. Um, hitting the nail on the head, where is the conviction? Where is the vision in politics? It hasn't improved in a year that I've had a, a break from the role. Um, and we still see both of the big parties tearing themselves apart. And that the, the irony is they think that changing the dude at the front is going to change people's minds rather than changing the policies. 
I mean, they, I think they need to get out and listen to the community a bit more and actually realise that they're meant to be governing for people. They're not there just to have a popularity contest amongst themselves. And I think the real reason we're not seeing policy reform on issues that actually matter, um, like climate change, like affordable housing, like funding for schools and hospitals, is because both of the large parties, and the, the nationals included, are taking massive donations from big business, and those same big businesses are effectively buying the policy outcomes that suit them and suit their bottom lines, and the community's coming last. And people understand this now. They know that there's been millions of dollars made in corporate donations okay, to both time. sides of politics, and they want their democracy back, oh. and they deserve it. I'm just going to see if um, we'll just go back to our questioner in a moment and see if uh, how he responds to this. Bob Catter. Um, I, I was at a distance. I wasn't down there, but it just seemed to me that you had a bunch of careerists uh, competing for class captain. I mean, the first year was spent on the yes no vote. We lived together for five months. You're automatically married. Waste of time. The second year was spent on the citizenship, which could have been cleaned up in five minutes, but both of them wanted to make political capital out of it. And the third year has been on leadership. Now, I mean, has anything been done about electricity? And I'm sorry, George, to disagree with you strongly, but I speak with authority because I was the Minister for Electricity when we had the cheapest electricity charges in the world. And it is enormously simple to go back to the cheapest electricity charges in the world the cheapest petrol prices in the world, and you are well aware of that through ethanol, and the food prices, there was an 80% markup between the farmer and the consumer. There is now a 300% markup. Bob, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to call time because we're going to come back to those issues. Quickly go back to our questioner. Um, can you just pop up for a sec? Uh, Nathan, um, you voted uh, for the Liberals last time round. Um, has this instability cause you to rethink what you're going to do next time around, or are you going to wait and see how Morrison goes? I think it's going to be a, a wait and see how Morrison goes. I'd like to see some action. We just, with the, uh, the former minister um, and now ex-PM Malcolm Turnbull, just toing and froing between his ideologies and what was going to be best for him, yet what was best for the country. We just got nowhere out of this. OK, uh, Bob, just a quick one back to you. Uh, Malcolm Turnbull uh, announced today he's going to resign during the week. That means when you go back to Parliament in two weeks' time, uh, the government will have lost its majority because they won't be able to have a, uh, a by-election in Wentworth. Um, does that give you greater power as a crossbencher? It gives us enormous power. And because George Christensen had the guts to stand up on the bank inquiry, we were able to get... And unfortunately, he was forced to vote for the Liberal um, bank inquiry instead of the proposal that we were putting forward for a bank inquiry, which would have been a serious bank inquiry. Well, we're going to come... Uh, Bob, but I'm I don't to, knock... Bob, I'm not trying to, um, yeah, uh, to, uh, to just... preempt you here, except we are going to come to the bank question later. But just on this question of power... Um, if... Yes, I'll have a lot more power, and I'll exercise that for the people of North Queensland fairly ruthlessly, I can tell you. Cathy... Um... <laughs> So what we're hearing here does suggest um, there's going to be opportunities for Labor to create mayhem in the parliament um, if you can get the crossbenchers on site. Absolutely. And um, I sit here as a very proud member of the Labor Party. We have been a stable policy producing party for five years. Uh, the government last week was absolutely appalling. I'm new to Canberra and I have never in my life seen such a dereliction of duty uh, as we saw last week. Since when do you just pack up and go home because you can't get your own way? Since when? In the workforce, you get sacked. Uh, what I would also like to say, Tony, is that we are working very hard on policies. Bill Shorten has been to the Herbert Electric 17 times since November 2015. He is listening to the people in my community. He understands regional Queensland and we will deliver for regional Queensland. And we have the policies that will ensure small business, pensioners, veterans, health, education are looked after. OK, going to go to our next question. It's from also on the uh, issue of the uh, uncertainty in politics. Kelly Pledger. I am a 20-something-year-old graduate working within the mining and resource sector. I am a Liberal voter, and like many young Liberals, I consider myself to be an economic conservative rather than a social conservative. Given the latest spill, 
has the Liberal Party reached a point where it can no longer adequately represent the views of both economic and social conservatives simultaneously? How do they expect to retain young voters such as myself, who, like me, on one hand, look at the Liberal Party for economic growth, but on the other hand, are ashamed of the outdated ideas of some party members? George Christensen, start with you. I know you're not a Liberal, but you yep. are obviously in the coalition. Yep. So, uh, obviously, we're LNP in Queensland, but I sit in the National Party, uh, which is a very different party uh, ideologically to the Liberal Party, actually. Um, but uh, I guess that... Um, we both hold uh, Liberals and Nationals to a belief in small government, uh, a belief in lower taxation, a belief in less regulation and just letting people get on with it rather than having government stand in their way. And I think you're going to see that from Scott Morrison as Prime Minister. Uh, so, uh, you know, that there will be that, that sort of Liberal ethos that, uh, that you like so much, the economic sort of side of things. So I just want to add one thing about stability, though. Yes. Uh, uh, Bill Shorten has come up here a lot, Tony, but he's come up here a lot to tell people about uh, how he likes coal mining and then zip down to Melbourne to tell people that he doesn't like coal mining. <laughs> so, you know, that's really not stability at all. OK, let me ask you this about stability, since you uh, raised it. Um, if Malcolm Turnbull is gone, um, he will be gone, uh, when the parliament next sits, um, how stable will this government be without a majority? Well, look, uh, I've talked to Bob in the last uh, week and uh, Bob's obviously going to support us. He's got some views uh, there for North Queensland and uh, I've got to say, just about every single one of them I support. Uh, stuff like ethanol, uh, stuff like looking at, uh, at dams, uh, dealing with their insurance premiums. I think it's actually a great opportunity for North Queensland MPs to actually band together and... Uh, demand something for the North uh, because we often get forgotten. Uh, you're, you're to, so, so you're talking about possibly an alliance between you and Bob Catter, uh, Northern Queenslanders rather than members of political parties, oh. putting the government under pressure. Is that what you're saying? I have never been a party man, right or wrong. I have been someone who's been out there for the North and if there's an option for the North to get a win, uh, then I'm in on it. So you might go with the crossbench rather than the government? Well, if uh, we have to cross the floor on something that's a pivotal issue for the North, uh, I'm willing to do that. I've always been willing to do that. Let's quickly go back has, to... I want to go back started. to... Bob, just a second. We'll go back to our questioner again. And I just want to just get your sense. Um, are, are you in the position where you're thinking of changing your vote or are you in the wait-and-see camp, see how Scott Morrison goes? I think I'm going to be one of the swing voters that's going to go to the crossbench. All right, OK. Pauline Hanson, there's a recipe for instability in the government. How do you see it? Well, it is because they haven't listened to grassroots Australians and the policies. Turnbull was seen too far to the left and he wasn't listening to the Conservative vote. That's why the rift. A lot of the issues that I've actually been talking about was immigration, right, um, lowering electricity prices, and watering Australia and the drought affected areas. What did the Prime Minister, new Prime Minister say? He talked about multiculturalism, not about immigration numbers. And that is the white elephant of the room here that is causing problems in the country. He's also spoken about lowering the electricity prices. And you have to be realistic about it. Um, we have especially here in Queensland, Rockhampton, I've got a business there. They're actually going to raise um, electricity prices by about $200,000 by 2020. So you're going to have another company that's going under. You've got hotels, you've got everyone, you've got restaurants that cannot afford the electricity prices. So unless they start reducing the electricity prices so it's competitive with the rest of the world, uh, we've got huge problems in this country. Cathy O'Toole. Look, I, th I think that um, we would be kidding ourselves if we think for one minute that this government that is so divided, like we have seen over the last week, could possibly perform a miracle and become a united team overnight. That is absolutely ridiculous thinking. I visit small business once a week. The very first thing they talk to me about is the cost of energy. Small business is struggling. And we need to do something about that. Labor has been willing to work in a bipartisan way with the government to address the electricity issues. And we have come to a full stop. They have not been willing to work with us. We live in the best part of the world when you consider we have 300 days of guaranteed sunshine every single year. 
We have the youngest coal-fired power stations in the country. We can move in a very smart, fair transition to new and renewable energy. We have all of the ingredients. But that would take effort, that would take a bipartisan approach, and we have not seen that That's in your the Parliament. OK, uh, the next question. Thank you very much. The next question comes from Cathy Nithanathan. <coughs> Cathy Nithanathan. Senator Anning's speech to Parliament, which you, Mr Catter, strongly supported, referenced the White Australia policy. But Senator Catter, your own grandfather, a Lebanese immigrant, would not have been allowed to migrate to Australia with your current beliefs. Please explain. Bob Catter. <laughs> um, I, firstly, my mother told me that you don't ask anyone oh. about their racial oh. origins or their money income um, or their religion. And, uh, and she told me she'd give me good hiding if I ever did. Now, we are all Australians, I would hope, in this room. And, you know, whether a person has this religion or that religion is utterly irrelevant. The policy of our party has been very clear. And if you can find anywhere in that speech where he advocated white Australia policy, I'd be very curious to find out where it is. Well, I'll, I'll, I might uh, even I'll, give you a Bob, check if, you, if you want to know, I'll let money. you know. I mean, uh, we'll, leave, right we'll leave aside right your ahead. complex ancestry for a minute. But uh, Fraser Anning's speech was lamenting the end of the white Australia policy. It was all about the white Australia policy. He said it was a bipartisan policy for a solely European-based immigration, supported by Labor leaders from Chifley to Corwell. He was talking about the white Australia policy. Tony, he said a preponderance of Europeans. Now, if you want to be technical, preponderance means a majority. Now, surely the people of European descent have the right to be able to maintain... Now, you're bringing 640,000 people a year into this country, from countries with no democracy, no rule of law, um, no egalitarian traditions, no Judeo-Christian, love your fellow man, do good to others, no trade unions and no um, wage structures, award wage structures. Now, you're bringing 640,000 a year into this country. The ACTU, in a magnificent report that they commissioned, said that one out of every two jobs created since 2013 has gone to a temporary... Visa holder. There's 640,000 people coming in, 200,000 school leavers. That's 800,000, 840,000 people chasing 200,000 jobs. Okay, Bob. The country Bob, must go bankrupt. Time's up. Must time's up bankrupt. on that. Time's up. Just before we move on, uh, people who've known you for a very long time were shocked to hear you give 1,000% support to a speech that talked about a final solution in the context of Muslim immigration. Can you explain? why you gave 1,000% support to a speech that talked about a final solution. I, I, I will let Avi Yemeni have the last say. I'll answer that. He can answer the question. As Australia's proudest Jew, I am sickened because, once again, the perpetually outraged drop up in arms about something they care nothing about. They're using the pain and suffering of my community, the horrors of the Holocaust, that my grandparents escaped to push their agenda. Many of those that are pushing that narrative hate Jews. In fact, the Islamic Council, etc., etc. Fraser Anning has done more for the Jewish community and Israel than most of those who are outraged have done in their entire careers. Bob, I'm not, wait, and wait, that wait. reflects the Jewish position okay. in this country. All right, let's hear from Pauline Hanson, because you were appalled uh, well, by that speech. Tell us why. I'm not going back to the to find a solution. Um, I, it, to tell you the honest truth, I had no idea what that meant. So, uh, that was a please explain moment. So, anyway. But you, you but, did, so did, uh, did you not say no, it was something was, out of well, Goebbels' handbook? Yes, it was. Um, what, I, what I will say here is that I was appalled by him referring to a white Australia policy. We're past that. They tried to tag me with that years ago, that I was wanting to white Australia policy. Oh, and I've been trying why. to actually... I wonder why. No, there's no wonder why, Larissa. I never said that because I called for equality. And if you look at my immigration policy, it is non-discriminatory, right? So it's people like you and the media that have misrepresented what I've tried to say over the years. That's why I was pulled by it because I would not be associated with it because I've never called for it, never, ever. Okay, I'm just going to... Pauline, there's a so, question specifically for you from, for, 
Khadija Fatima. Hi, Pauline. Uh, my name is Khadija Fatima. My question for you is that you said that you were deeply offended by the comparisons made between you and Fraser Anning after his maiden speech. How will you justify this when you yourself called for immigration ban in your maiden speech, as well as stating, we are in danger of being swamped by Asians? And then again in 2016, you stated, we are in danger of being swarmed by Muslims. So when you both are on the same page, why do you take so much of offense? Mm. Yes. Okay, right. got to hear the answer, thank you. Fraser was actually calling for a white Australian policy, and I've always advocated you don't have to be white to be Australian. What our concern here in Australia by many Australians is that the Muslims have a different ideology and the belief and assimilating into our society. We have a problem across the world with Muslims who are not prepared to integrate into our society. And I'm not saying all Muslims. What I'm wanting to see is a moratorium. Let's see where we're going, that people have to assimilate into our society. Because people come out here, they, th they see us as the easy country, the easy touch, and they come out here and they don't assimilate, they don't want to assimilate. They have their own ideology, their own views, their own culture, and they have no intentions of Can, can I quickly go back to our questioner, uh, Khadija Fatima. Uh, Khadija, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, actually, I understand what you're trying to say. It's not just Muslims. There are people across different religions who have different ideologies. There are people across from different religions who are doing violence in different countries. Why just focus on Muslims every single Sorry, time? Sorry, a lot of the terrorism problems that we have in the country have been from Muslims because they have a totally different ideology. They do not appreciate the West. They do not like the West. And that's the problems that we have. And so from a lot of countries around the world. And I will call it out for how I see it. And a lot of our Australians see it the same way. So I, I'm sorry if it, I'm not out to offend people. I'm here to protect Australians, that we feel safe on our streets. Okay. And we don't want the problems here. I'm just going to, I'm just going to ask uh, Khadija. Do you feel offended by that notion? I'm as much an Australian as you are, Pauline. And I can I'm tell not you denying that. All the Australians. That's fine. We take. But respect, I, take all our right. people respect our laws and our culture and our way of life. Our law, okay. our Sharia law says the first law is to follow the law of your country. Any Muslim in this room across the country will tell you the same. We never go against the law of this country. I don't know where you get your beliefs from. Ask any Muslim. What you're talking about are the ideologies of a country, like Saudi Arab. That's a country by itself. They have their own laws. Don't push it on all the Muslims across the world. No, that's different. OK. Thank you very much. Let's hear from other panelists. Cathy, I'll start with you. Uh, thank you, Tony. Um, that's a really good question. Uh, my grandfather uh, was Lebanese. My mother is a first-generation Australian. I would not be sitting here if Fraser Anning's speech was enacted. I found it absolutely appalling. I come from Townsville, where we have a very big multicultural city. You walk through our hospitals, you walk through our university, James Cook University in particular, and you see the specialist professors that are working in that environment have come from countries around this world. And let me tell you, they are outstanding professionals. We do not need hatred in this country. We do not need to be lectured by people who may not understand the way other people live. I have worked with people from different ethnic backgrounds in the mental health space and the trauma and the torture that they have experienced to get to this country where they thought they were going to be accepted. They are so grateful to be here. And what do we do? smack them in the face with hatred and bigotry. It's not good enough. It is not the Australian way. We are better than that. George Christensen. <laughs> you heard Fraser Anning's speech. Where do you stand on it? Oh, well, look, I, uh, I don't know why everyone go, got so uh, aggro that day in Parliament over the musings of a uh, senator from a minority party of two. It's not like he was about to change a national immigration policy, really. Well, um, and and, and I've got to say, it wasted don't, half don't of Parliament, start, half a don't day of Parliament talking about that. Um, no. You know, well, well, I'm sorry, Bob, but he's not going to influence immigration policy anytime soon. Um, but the reality is, immigration policy yeah, should not be based of Australia on, agree on, with our on position. Uh, please, Bob. Uh, immigration policy shouldn't be based on race or religion. But there are people with genuine concerns 
about cultures that come into this country that might be against our own culture and against our own values. And that's quite legitimate. That's not racist to say. There's concerns about the level of immigration in this country, uh, putting pressure particularly on capital cities. Concerns about immigration coming in and supplanting Australian workers. Again, that's not racist to say. So there are legitimate concerns, Tony, about immigration that uh, really shouldn't... All right, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you there because we've actually racist. got a question on this and I'll go to that and we will come to... Uh, uh, to Larissa as well. The question is from like uh, Jeff. Oh, hang on a sec. Jeff Kioski has a question. You might want to respond to it in a minute. Go ahead. Um, I'm one of 70% of Australians who have concerns about where and how our immigration is being managed. The government says we choose who comes here, but do we? As, as the Liberals and Labor parties lack the will to listen to the people, should we have a people's vote uh, on immigration? That is all we've asked for. That's all we've asked for, a people's vote. What do you think people should have a say? No, he's asking whether you should have one, I think, Bob. So uh, I think when, you got when, the answer. When you, said, when you said the FS word, and I'm not going to use it, when you said the FS word, it was referring to a vote of the Australian people on immigration. And contrary to the two speak questioners before, our policy has never been along religious or racial lines. It has been along the lines, and I apologise to nobody for this, that if you're going to bring people in from the Middle East and North Africa, surely the preference should be given to the persecuted minority groups, who are the Sikhs, 84,000 of them murdered in one year, the bulk of them in India, but a lot of them in Pakistan, the Jews and the Christians. And if we keep standing aside, and watching the Jews persecute this country and do nothing about it, then we have a repeat of the anti-Semitism, pre-war anti-Semitism that our country has to be ashamed okay, of. Okay, Bob, um, I, I'd say that coming from someone who has just supported a speech which referred to the final solution, and you oh, may have been Tony, able... Tony, don't keep saying you that. You may have been able... He was referring to a vote. He was referring to a vote of the Australian people. A monster called Hitler was referring to the murder of six million people. And you're equating the murder of six million people and insulting every person of Jewish descent in this country okay. by doing it. And, and I can give All right, okay, you've already example done that. after Larissa, example Larissa after Waters. example. Yeah. Larissa Waters, go um, ahead. Look, I want to take issue with the notion that somehow our infrastructure is under pressure from migration. What is happening here when you see all of this mob fanning the flames of racism and division, it is a perfect distraction from the fact that they are not governing the country properly and they have underfunded the services that we all deserve and need to live better quality lives. Tony, can I and I think it's incredibly divisive and unhelpful, as well as a very clever distraction mechanism, um, to be fanning such hatred in this community. We are stronger when we are together. Look around. Look at all of the wonderful different people in this audience. Of course we're all Australian. Of course we're stronger when we recognise and celebrate that diversity. And I think it's, it's abominable that people would use fear and division to further their own political careers. They should be ashamed of themselves. T Tony, can I ask that question? Well, no. Oh, bef bef I want to hear from Pauline Hanson because uh, the questioner asked whether there should be a people's vote on the levels of immigration. Um, where do you stand on this? Totally agree. Actually, I tried to move my private members bill on the floor of Parliament uh, last Monday, and what happened was is the Labor Party kept the debate going on a previous bill so I couldn't get up and speak about it. So they actually, and supported, and when it came to a division with it, uh, to allow the, my, um, that debate to stop and go on to my bill, um, it was Fraser Anning who voted with the Labor and the Greens so it didn't get up for a debate. Uh, before I come to the Labor side for an answer, I want to hear from George Christensen on this because you've just talked about this issue. You've now heard someone suggesting there should be a vote. You've also talked about the power you will have to actually cross the floor uh, where the government has a very... Th well, no majority, in fact, uh, once Malcolm Turnbull's gone. If you cross the floor, they'll have no majority. You could actually force a vote on immigration. Would you consider doing that? 
Well, I don't know how you'd vote on immigration policy. I mean, I think that's up to the government to set. And we just need to be mindful. It's not racism, Larissa. There are real pressures on the cities. So fix and, and, them. And Don't blame immigrants. Well, well, well you want to shut oh, down coal mining. Science. You want to yeah. shut down coal mining, which funds all that upgrade. So, it does. You know, it's uh, it does. More handouts you know, in this than state, you get off in this state it does. That's Give nonsense. them more handouts than so, you get so off you've them had in go, royalties. Mate, you've had you know go. the figures. Uh, but, but look, the, the reality is that uh, I don't know that you could have a vote on it. The government's just got to get on with it and do it. And I think the vast majority of people do realise there is a problem with uh, uh, the, the immigration rate that we've got, the pressure it's putting on cities, the pressure it puts on workers. I mean, Labor raises this issue all the time, uh, even though they were the ones that brought in so many foreign workers uh, under Bill Shorten. Uh, so there are legitimate issues. And also, I would say... The issue of culture and the clash that there can be with the community here in Australia is a legitimate issue that's not racist. So, just to confirm, because we're talking about the, the strategic power you might hold, would you be prepared to use that to try and change immigration policy? Well, I'm going to use my power as a member of the government to try and get them to change the policy on immigration. I've got to say there's a lot of backbenchers that want the government to change its policy on immigration, and I think that you will see that reflected under the new leadership. Okay, no, Cathy O'Toole first and then um, you can talk. It would have been really great, George, to see you across the floor for penalty rates. Um, well, I did. Cathy. I think... Uh, I did. Maybe. I did. Maybe. And you should acknowledge that I did. No. I did. Yeah. Uh, you won't acknowledge the real, that I did. The yeah, real did. issue here Bob is Cattano. around wasting line, money on a referendum to decide on immigration. What a great distraction from the fact in my community unemployment is at 9%. Youth unemployment is at 20%. We have lost 3,000 manufacturing mob don't jobs. Want to go ahead. We have lost 149 Australian tax office jobs. We have lost 40 uh, defence, uh, 50 defence staff jobs, 40 aviation jobs. That's where our attention needs to be placed. We need to be working on jobs for everyday Australians. Kids leaving school who can't get a job. Kids leaving school who can't afford to go to university. People in aged care facilities who are being fed on $6 a day and don't have enough staff. Veterans, one in five veterans is attempting suicide. Uh, Bob Catter, uh, 30 seconds because we've got to get on to other questions. Um, I, I, just, I must have lost my communication skills, Tony, completely. <laughs> there are 640,000 people a year coming into an economy that's only creating 200,000 jobs. Now, can't you add up? Well, That's uh, like four. Bob, 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 Bob do you, you, you accept that many... Uh, 200,000 Bob, Bob, school leavers. Bob, um, just, just a bit of a fact check here. Um, an awful lot of those people are people who are paying to come to our universities. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm pleased... One of the biggest uh, industries in the country. I'm pleased you raised that. Four billion. Because 24 billion is coming in to the universities. They take the jobs off the Australians and the Australians go on to welfare. I mean, can't you understand that if you're bringing 640,000 people in an economy only generating 200,000 okay. jobs with 200,000 school leavers, that's 840,000 people Bob, Bob, chasing... Bob, Bob, we're going we're to leave, we're gonna leave, that, we're gonna leave those facts to the dog. fact checkers because so. we just don't have time oh, okay. tonight. I, I but the fact checkers will no doubt be on I, top of that one. I look uh, remember, if you hear any doubtful claims on Q&A, let us know on Twitter. Keep an eye on the RMIT... <laughs> ABC Fact Check and the Conversation website for the results. Now, the next question comes from Debbie Elwood. <laughs> Hi. It's probably not the most important question of the night, <laughs> um, but it is quite relevant to our region. Um, Central Queensland Mackay and Sundays remained crock free from the 1960s to the 1990s. Since being protected in the early 1970s, we now have an overwhelming number of crocodiles in this area. We cull kangaroos. We have even culled koalas. Would we ever consider culling crocodiles as they have no real natural predator in Australia? George Christensen. Yeah, look, uh, we, should, we should consider it. I mean, when you've got uh, crocs swimming up onto beaches where young nippers uh, train like they do out at Imeo, uh, it's happened on the Strand at Townsville, Obviously, there's the population's increased too much and it's encroaching into urban territory. I'm not talking about wholesale slaughter of crocodiles. I'm talking about a managed cull. It can be done uh, and, you know, you don't have to have people going crazy over it. You just uh, cull them back from urban areas. It's, it's quite simple. Larissa Waters. 
Oh, look, I think the notion that we can't learn to live with our natural environment is really hard. <laughs> when it's eating you, you can't. <laughs> and the point, the point I will make is that we have crocodile management plans that languish on the shelf and that are underfunded. We routinely underfund um, wildlife management plans. So I, we don't support culling crocs. It won't, it won't be everybody's cup of tea, but that's where we stand. We are willing and happy to listen to the expert advice on how to better manage them and how to learn to live with them. But killing them isn't the answer. Pauline Hanson. Cull them. You have to. Uh, I, I can't. No, they, they are a person of danger. They don't have any predators themselves. And the fact is they are actually encroaching on, on areas where Animals have been taken by them. People have been taken by them. I pity those those people who come by, by the boats up in the Daintree at the moment. Who, you know, if they, are those last two going to survive with the crocs up there? But anyway, that's their problem. But um, yeah, I I think cull them. By all means, you know, this is this is stupid. Larissa, you care more about that than caring about the, the animals, the dogs, you know, the, the people and that are out there that have been taken by crocs. The people don't feel safe to actually well, go into the waterways. Many of the people that are taken by crocs have often had a couple to drink and they're going into the water after dark, OK? So... <laughs> So they deserve People. it, and, and, oh. a, and I've got to say, there, there is Goodness an industry, there is an industry greens as well. To be aware of you know, the risks the when you're in want crop to habitat. Actually, there's an industry there to actually take the eggs, and they they can actually create an industry there. But the government is stopping yeah, but them that's from not doing what's it being with, proposed. With the okay, all right, hang on. Let's so hear from the other panelists, Kathy O'Toole. Right. Um, well, we've only had a couple of crocs on the strand to make it quite clear, and they haven't eaten anybody yet. Um, uh, I would... So, it's not really something that... Oh, um, like it eaten, Well, it's not something that bothers my uh, office on a daily basis, Bob. I can assure you there are far more pressing issues. Uh, this is something where I think you take advice from the experts if it is a real problem. But it's certainly not something that is troubling my office on a day-to-day -day basis. OK, we, we'll come to some of the issues that are troubling your office. Uh, Bob Catter, just on the crocodiles. Um, I represent, you know, the Greater Cairns area, if you like, a tourism area, and we've been very seriously damaged, um, and we're going to be a lot more seriously damaged. Now, you know, nature has been knocked completely out of balance. The biggest predator by far and away was man. And I have seen my first Australian cousin brothers, they race in and they pick up the eggs with the mother there and they cut a hold her at bay, you know, and take the eggs. Each crocodile has 60 or 70 eggs. If you imagine every woman in this room having 60 or 70 babies, you have some idea of the population explosion that is going on out there. Now, all that Shane Canute is saying is that we North Queenslanders want our waterways back. They have been taken off us. We want them back. That's all we're saying. And, and we're saying removal. We haven't actually said... OK, all right, let's, um, let's move along. It's time to get to our next question on arguably a more controversial issue, at least up here. It's from Ronald Fyreben. Last week I went to Canberra and was one of 35 bank victims who shared their stories of alleged injustices about the banks. About a third of the bank victims were from North Queensland. We heard stories of banks fraudulently changing documents, regulatory <coughs> processing changed to <coughs> the banks and numerous conspiracies to financially break the customers. Has there been greater corruption in the banking system in North Queensland than anywhere else? And are you demanding the Royal Commission be extended to investigate every aspect of the corruption which has been uncovered? Ronald, just before you sit down, um, is, it, is it true that you're one of the people who lost your uh, property, lost your farm? No. Um, my matter's with Suncorp Bank. Um, last week, they actually... This is how dumb they are. They actually uh, gave my lawyer, forwarded on forged documents. Um, when I went to Canberra two weeks ago, we had... I had the loan papers, which had no signatures on there. When we requested... Okay, uh, I don't think we can get into all the okay. details. Um, were, you, were, you under, were you under threat of having your property foreclosed? I have, <coughs> after I gave evidence at Rome last year, um, yes, I've been threatened um, with the receivers, administrators. Uh, okay. It's been numerous times, and Suncorp Bank keep losing the battle on that. All right, let's go. Um, Pauline Hanson, we'll start with you. Uh, the extension of the Royal Commission into banks. 
I've actually written to a letter to the former Prime Minister with regards to this. I asked a question in the, for in the House last week about the extension to the Royal Commission to include liquidators, receivers and administrators and to extend the time. Um, they were told it's up to the Commissioner to actually request that. It was through the inquiry of One Nation Held, we called for a Royal Commission. The Prime Minister then at the time said, no, we, it's too, going to take too long, too much money. We pushed forward with that. We got to send an inquiry into it. Through that same inquiry, we took it out to Roma and we actually allowed people to have a say in that. The day before our report was handed down calling for a Royal Commission, the Nats pushed um, the government to actually have a Royal Commission into it after eight former Senate inquiries into it. So I think One Nation was very instrumental in getting the Senate inquiry up and uh, we're actually pushing for an extension to actually involve that, plus also mortgage insurance as well. I okay. think it's been included in it. Cathy O'Toole. Uh, that is exactly why Labor pushed for a Royal Commission into banking, and absolutely it needs to be extended. I have numerous people coming into my office who have had absolutely horrific things done to them through the banking and financing sector. We also need to have it extended so that we can get the Commonwealth uh, Super Corporation that veterans uh, have their superannuation with addressed as well. That is the only super fund that has been left out. Uh, without a doubt, this Royal Commission needs to be done thoroughly and properly and people who have been treated very, very poorly and have lost everything need the opportunity to have their voice heard. Now, Cathy, Cathy in two weeks' time, um, Parliament resets. The government won't have a majority. Now, if Labor and crossbenchers and possibly um, someone crossing the floor like George Christensen um, were to actually move on this... It could change very quickly, couldn't it? It could. It would, could. would you expect that to be a, a tactic? Look, I think it is a very, a very good idea, Tony, because the reality Not is... Not my idea, just no, no, so but you know. <laughs> Give credit where credit's due. Um, the, what's coming out of the Royal Commission into banking is absolutely scandalous. It is really devastating. And I have seen things that have been done to families that should, they should never have been exposed to, the lies that have been told, the falsification of documents, all of the things you've mentioned, Ronald. This needs to be cleaned up, and to do that, it has to run for a length of time that ensures that every aspect is covered, without Bob, a doubt. Bob Catter, we talked about the power you may have um, in a, effectively a hung parliament. Um, would you use it to do something like this? Well, just remember, it was George Christensen coming with my legislation which the ALP, we thank them, and the Greens and the other cross benches agreed to, um, that forced the issue with the Liberal Party. But this inquiry falls a million miles short of where it should be. A million miles short. And I speak with authority because I was the minister responsible for the state bank. I mean, the farmers that are in trouble, we pulled almost the entire sugar industry through one of the worst crises in our history, and we made $200 million profit out of it. So, Tony, the answers are there, they are simple, but they're not going to come out of this inquiry. And we, we, we nominated prominent Australians to go on a panel for the inquiry. Not one person picked by the government, by the Prime Minister, who is in fact a banker. I mean, please, spare me. Um, we, we wanted people, and Tim Costello was one of those people. That'll give you some idea of the people that we wanted on that inquiry. So, Bob, is this something, just to go back to the, the question I asked you earlier, is this something you might want to use your crossbench power to actually force the, through? Tony, as soon as we get back, I will be moving for an extension of that inquiry and a far deeper, far more reaching inquiry than is taking place at the present moment. I can give you horrific story after horrific story after terrific story. Okay. Sugar mills, $200 million sugar mills being sold out from under us for $2 million. I mean, just outrageous. Okay, George Christensen, um, again, uh, you could find yourself in a position where you could cross the floor and support um, this legislation and extend the bank inquiry. North Queensland issue, would you do it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we need to extend that Royal Commission. It might not come to that. I've actually written to the Commissioner uh, asking him to consider and spelling out a brief of evidence as to why he should do that, uh, including situations like yours, sir, and uh, 
I've got to say I'd be very interested to see your case and talk to you after the show uh, more about that. There's been too many injustices done, too many lies, too many falsifications and fabrications by the banks, and uh, that's why we need to delve more into the small business victims and more into the farming victims. So I hope that the Commissioner is going to call for that extension because uh, Matthias Cormann, the Finance Minister, has already said if the Commissioner calls for it, uh, he will allow for an extension. So uh, I'm very hopeful that'll happen. Um, the Greens, uh, I imagine, are in a bipartisan kind of consensus with the whole panel on this. But yeah, I, well, look, I'm, we're, I'm assuming. We're cheering because obviously it's, it's widely accepted that we were pushing for the Royal Commission for a very, very long time. And in fact, the current Prime Minister voted against it 26 times, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm really glad that folk have changed their mind on this. And Ronald, your experience is sadly um, just one of so many where these massive corporates have been ripping people off. Now, it's unfortunate that we don't have a public owned bank anymore to actually be there to service people and just to loan them money, not try to flog them off other services. I agree very strongly with that. Understand. Very strongly. But with the Royal Commission, we have supported it. We've been one of the strongest supporters to do that. I am concerned, okay. though, that it is a smokescreen for not actually changing the laws. Mm. Right. We know what needs to happen. We need to cap those bank CEO salaries for a start because they are massively profiteering on your money. OK. On that note of consensus, we'll move to an area of which I doubt there will be consensus. Angela Sang. Hello. In this electorate, we have only one choice when it comes to energy providers. Electricity bills are one of the real issues affecting this community, including farmers who are now having trouble irrigating because electricity costs are so high. How do you plan to attack the problem of exorbitant energy bills? That was Pauline Hanson. Well, I'll start here in Queensland. You, you do only have one energy provider here in North Queensland. That is a big problem. Um, you, another problem is the Queensland Labor government, actually 47% of your bill is actually for the poles and wires. So a lot of your costs, they reap they, they take in $2.2 billion a year into the coffers, so mm. they're charging nearly half your bill okay. is going to the state government. So they're not prepared to answer that. So you need to put in new coal-fired power stations in North Queensland, and you yeah. need to actually bring down the power costs. Let's hear from uh, George Christensen. Um, first of all, do you agree with that um, solution? Yeah, well, look, uh, a lot of uh, what's been suggested is what the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission have recommended to the government. Uh, we're going to set a standard default price, uh, which they believe will automatically bring down uh, power bills for householders and small businesses, including farmers. Uh, but we need to go further than that. Uh, Paul Ange just said something that's, uh, that's incredible incredibly sensible there, that the state government actually does take a, a tax on the way through uh, every time you turn on the PowerPoint. And uh, the ACCC have recognised that and said what we need to do is have energy companies and state governments uh, write down the uh, poles and wires, uh, completely depreciate that, uh, and therefore, and then you pass on savings to, uh, to householders, to businesses, to farmers. Uh, but we also need to think long term putting more baseload power, more reliable baseload power, and that means coal-fired power, it really does. Do you feel, do you, do you, do you feel before we come to uh, Larissa, you obviously want to respond to that, um, do you feel that uh, Scott Morrison has effectively given you a kind of pledge on this, or do you not know uh, where that is? Um, there is this uh, Northern power. Development Fund, yes. which hasn't been spent yet, do you expect that to be used to build a coal-fired power station? Well, I know that if an investor came forward to the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility who wanted to build a coal-fired power station, it would finance it. I know that for a fact, uh, as long as it all um, stacked up. And we're going to make it stack up because the government has announced that it's going to underwrite uh, the construction of, of reliable baseload power, including coal-fired power, and that's needed. It's simple economics. You put more supply into the system prices come down. That's the long-term plan. How quickly would you expect it to happen in North Oh, Queensland? well, unfortunately, if we find some sort of skink, Larissa will probably hold it up for seven years. But, uh, <laughs> you know... Um, uh, <coughs> bomb, bomb. OK, you're going to write a reply to that. Yeah, thank um, you. You didn't give an answer, so you're not expecting it to happen any time soon. Well, five years is what it should take, five okay. years. So you'd expect there to be a coal-fire power station. Is that something you'll be expecting from the new government? I expect that we're going to have investors come forward, as we've had Trevor St Baker, as someone who plays in the energy game a lot, has come forward saying he's going to construct a coal-fired power station with that uh, policy we've got. 
So, yeah, I do expect there's going to be coal-fired power stations built. Larissa. Look, you won't get any private investor to come forward and invest in coal. It is on the decline. Of course we need new baseload supply. We need clean energy baseload supply. We know that building new renewables is cheaper than building new oh, coal. Rubbish. All of the yeah. experts will tell us that. So, of course, we need to bring power prices down. We can do that with clean energy. It's more job intensive. It won't cook the reef. It will help us address climate change. And it's going to work. We now have clean baseload power that can bring down prices and solve, solve the issues okay, that let's see what the, so many uh, people are facing. Let's see what the Labor Party thinks. Uh, Cathy O'Toole. Uh, well, it's very interesting that you would say that, George, because it takes seven years to actually build a coal-fired power station at two and a half times the cost. Uh, we need to move to renewable energy. There is no argument about that. Queensland has... Queensland is in probably the most enviable position in the country where we have the youngest of the coal-fired power stations. We can plan well. We can do a fair and just transition. Let me give you an example of the disaster of managing energy that this government has done. In 2014, Townsville missed out on a hydropower uh, plant that was going to be invested in on the Burdick and Falls Dam oh, by Meridian gosh. Energy. Oh, because, oh, because, oh, Bob... The oh, Chief Executive oh, said the Federal Government's protracted efforts to reduce the, oh. the renewable energy target have made long-term capital investments in energy so, assets in this country so near impossible. Yeah. Matt Canavan said last week in Rockhampton that building a coal-fired power station in North Queensland was not a priority of this Government. Scott Morrison has said that coal-fired power is not cheap, it is not reliable, and it's actually a bit of a myth that it's cheaper. So that tells you exactly where the government is going. They know that our future is renewable energy, but they haven't got a plan to do anything about addressing energy sources or costs in this country, and it is an absolute disgrace. OK, Bob Catter. Remember, you've got under Ta a minute. Tony, remember that I was the minister when we had the cheapest electricity in the world, and that is how we secured the aluminium industry. Now, please listen to me. The price was $670 for a householder in 1988. In 1999, it was still $670. There was no argument to put it up. We had reserved resource policies, so we're taking the coal for free. There's hardly any labour content. And, of course, the power stations had all been paid off. So what right had you to put the prices up? No one had any right. And, Cathy, it was your government that agreed to the Liberal Party policy of free enterprise, completely deregulating the industry and privatising it. Now, that is what happened between the year 1999 and 2003. In 2003, the graph just goes like that. That's a minute, Bob, I'm afraid. That, that just goes like that to $2,400. OK. From 670 for 10 years to $2,400. And the way you put it back, I hate to say it, is to renationalise it and re-regulate it. Okay. And forget about any other solution. All right, we're going to move on. Next question from Zephyr Ralph. Hello. How are you guys going? Um, I'm a 21-year-old um, ex-miner. I used to work out in the coal fields. I've now recently jumped into nursing because I didn't see coal mining as really a sustainable sort of industry for energy. So my question today is, with parts of Australia going through drought, farmers struggling to source water with the declining health of the Great Barrier Reef, which generates roughly $6.4 billion yearly to the Australian economy, supports 64,000 Australian jobs, and also with renewable energy becoming more affordable and sustainable, how can you justify going ahead with the proposed Adani coal mine that will generate less jobs, <coughs> contribute less to our economy by destroying our reef tourism industry and drain <coughs> billions of litres of precious water annually from the Great Artesian Basin for 60 years when the farmers are out there struggling right now? OK. okay. George Christensen. Well, uh, Zephyr, thanks. thanks for the question, Zephyr. Um, but, you know, uh, unfortunately... 
It sounds like, you know, if you've heard those green, extreme green claims, <laughs> which are uh, lies and there's many of them about this project. The facts on the Great Artesian Basin, that project, the Carmichael Coal Project, is going to require a maximum of 12 gigalitres of dam water per year from the Sutter River catchment, an entire separate water source to the Great Artesian Basin. Uh, it's only allowed to use that water when that, when that river is in flood, and it's got to pay $20 million uh, to do so. So it's not free water, it's not Great Artesian Basin water. We've seen a litany of lies from the Green Movement on this project, uh, putting up pictures of Philippines reefs, uh, portraying them as the Great Barrier Reef, uh, putting up pictures of the Boston Harbour being scooped and saying this is happening in the Cali Valley wetlands. I mean, this stuff is nonsense and I'll tell you what it's doing. It's knocking our economy and it's knocking job opportunities for the North. There are real people employed by Adani right now and they're in Townsville we'll, we'll, uh, and, and they we'll, should... We'll give you, the, we'll give you well, the chance to come back. You're the yeah. questioner. You get a I'm, chance to come back in a second. Hang on. I'm going to defend those people who work for that company uh, because okay. it's their jobs at risk. That's your, that's your and there's other people that could get jobs out of this. Okay. Destroying job opportunities for the North, and that falls with okay. you, Larissa. Uh, sorry, there's no point shouting. Just, 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 just you can stand up again and you can actually make your point. You can stand up and make your point if you so wish. All right, but, but yelling. Okay, all right. Yeah. Okay, all right. Okay, Larissa. Yeah, look, you can see the passion there. And Zephyr, I think you've made the right choice changing industries. And thanks for having the courage to raise your concerns here tonight. Um, Adani is not going to provide jobs. They have said they want to automate from pit to port. It, they are false jobs claims. I think it is cruel to be espousing that there is somehow going to be jobs created in We're a region shops. that's crying out for them when they're lies, they're fake jobs. It, we have jobs at the moment that are at risk because of our um, half the reef has been bleached thanks to climate change. And we have great potential for ecotourism jobs. We've got a growing service industry. We've got a knowledge economy. We've got infrastructure that the government should be investing to generate jobs. What, unfortunately, they have completely sold out to the coal industry. They take millions of dollars in donations from big coal and many other mining companies as well. Is it any wonder that we don't have a climate policy and that they want to fall over themselves to support an, a multinational corporation which has no vision and has had a terrible track record of corporate and social um, uh, breaches in other countries? They are just hooked on coal because they take the money okay. from the big coal companies. It's time to uh, clean up corporate donations Sorry. and get some support for clean energy. Sorry, that's your minute, Larissa. Um, Pauline Hanson. The Udani mine is actually indirectly, it's going to create 10,000 jobs. Oh. And that's that's true. directly wow. and indirectly. Of that, you have the operation and building of the mine and the railway line in conjunction is going to be 3,500 jobs. They, at operation level, it's going to be 1,250 jobs that are going to be created. People have to work the mine. Now, as far as the water, George was right, it doesn't come from the Artesian Basin. It comes from the Suda River and it has to be in flood to actually take it and the farmers with the licences take the water first before they can take the water. They're actually going to tap into any aquifers that, that are there, not the Artesian Basin. It's also, there is called a Ruan and that's a, the foundations there. It's about 250, 300 metres that actually goes to the um, clay stone. So therefore, it is not, there's not leakage from the, um, from the um, Artesian Basin into it. So the first five years, they have to put aside 750 megalitres of water to provide for that if there's ever, when they go to full production. They can actually mine about 60 million tonnes a year, but they're going to start production 27.5 million tonnes of coal a year. So you're not going to have that leakage from the Artesian Basin. This has been blown completely out of proportion. As far as damaging the reef, we've got it in about over 400 kilometres from the reef. So that has been a big furphy that saying it's destroying it's the reef. Climate the change. reef is well, not being, the reef is not being destroyed whatsoever. And they're talking about the water temperatures right. rising. Well, that is your minute, so uh, I'm going to go yep. to... What, where's Labor on this, uh, Cathy O'Toole? Um, um, it's very confusing. Well, I've been very clear on my position, and so has Labor. We will not give one red cent of taxpayers' money to a billionaire foreign company. We have always said no that it has they're to stack up the on its own merits. 
And let me say to you, congratulations for going into nursing, because in, nurse, in health and community services, that's where the growth in jobs are. Another thing I would like to say is, Townsville has learned a very smart lesson. Do not put all of your eggs in one basket when it comes to jobs. Q&I taught us that very, very quickly. That's why I've been going for infrastructure projects such as water security, energy just infrastructure to confirm, uh, and Kathy, the port. Just to confirm your position on the mine or Labor's <laughs> position, if Adani pays for it, you have no objections to it. Is that if, right? If, a, if the mine stacks up, it is not government's business to get involved in telling business what they can and can't do. They have to meet what? legislation. They have to do their own financial this is why uh, we have business. A with and then change. that is what will happen. It's not for me to say what they should do. What we the have legislation and that they must meet and then they must get their own okay. finances. All this right. is why uh, we don't have a national climate policy because they both take the money from the coal companies. So okay, time right. for one last question. Tony, can I have a chance to say? Well, you can... You can Wind your next answer into it, if you wouldn't mind. Um, the, uh, one last oh, question. Everyone else got to get one last question. Oh, OK, oh, Bob. <laughs> and I Thank think you. I probably know more about it than anyone else. And that wouldn't be, and that wouldn't be very hard. <laughs> sure. OK. Time for one last question. It comes from Helen Newell. Many voters in North Queensland feel neglected by politicians who have focused only on the infrastructure needs of our southern cities. Regional Queensland punches well above its weight, generating royalties from mining to help pay for this. We also produce much of the food to feed our nation and exports to boost our state and national economies. Our roads, health, education, community and small businesses need more support and resources to create jobs in North Queensland. Is the time right for the growing push to divide our huge state into, into north and south, yeah, yeah, yeah. ready, to, go, ready to, to gain traction? Bob, can I start with you and keep your answers short because we're nearly out of time. Um, we are releasing a paper shortly because the ALP and LNP told us we can't afford it. We can't afford not to. They have taken $29 billion just for tunnels in Brisbane. They have over 200 overpasses and we have 15 in North Queensland and we have the same population as Brisbane. I mean, how much longer are we going to keep copping it? And I can assure you, if we had got an extra 650 lousy votes in the last election, we'd have had that balance of power and we would have used it to create home rule as a first stage. And we would take the $5.5 billion to build Hellsgate Dam and a railway line into the Galilee, under condition that we control what is taking place yeah, there. Bob. And with Hell's Gate, there is no CO2 emissions at all, and all the electricity for North okay. Queensland. Sounds miraculous. Well, it bloody well is, to be quite frank. But we're never going to get it off Brisbane. Never, never. OK, so you're obviously in favour of two states in Queensland. So let's hear from <laughs> Cathy O'Toole. Uh, no, I'm not in favour of two states, and I thought the population actually hated politicians, so why you'd want more has left me quite bewildered. I agree. Um, <laughs> but I can say to you, as the only Labor member uh, north of the what I call the Golden Triangle, um, I am constantly uh, bringing to the attention of my leadership team the needs of regional Queensland. And you are right, when it comes to roads, schools, health and education, we need our fair share of investment. And I am really proud to sit here and say that I have acquired $100 million from uh, commitment from Labor for water security in Townsville, $200 million to address hydro on the Boudicca Falls Dam oh. and the $75 million to address the port expansion project, we, we which just is destroyed critical. Hell's Gates. Hell's Gate is Hell's not Gates. a water solution it. for Townsville, Bob, uh, and let's get is. that clear. It is not it. a you water can. solution oh, no, for OK, Bob. Bob, I think you've, we've, we've got your point. Uh, Pauline Hanson, two states in Queensland. Definitely not. Mm -hmm. um, I agree with Cathy. You don't want another because you're worried there'd have to be you three state of origin teams? You don't want another 12 <laughs> senators sitting around doing not, absolutely nothing. Um, I just feel that, um, look, although I live in the southeast corner of the state, I've actually worked extremely hard for, for 
northern uh, um, Queensland mm -hmm. and to, to try and get things done and brought, um, you know, about the buying up of the land for the Singaporeans from speaking to the Prime Minister. It was compulsory and I got it changed non-compulsory. I've got the code of conduct for the cane growers. So I've got the $5 million for the... Um, um, for the motorsport precinct in Townsville, you know, they, they fought for 13 years to get that done. So I've achieved a lot for, for Queensland. I think it's listening to people and trying to really represent those people and put ring to the floor of Parliament. Uh, George Christensen, two states in Queensland. Um, does, does the northern Queensland deserve its own <coughs> legislature? I think it's time. Brisbane's closer to Sydney than it is to Cairns and probably more than just geographical uh, reasons. It's also the, it, closer to them ideologically as well. Uh, I think that uh, we do not get our fair share. We will never get our fair share while we're dictated yeah, yeah. to by politicians yeah, yeah. in the southeast corner. Yeah, and yeah. the only way to change it is for a separate state. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. And uh, Larissa Waters, with your yeah, final word I there. I don't think North Queensland will ever get its fair share while we've got both of the major parties completely held hostage by their corporate donors. That's why infrastructure is that's underfunded. That's a nonsense, Larissa. That, well, I, give the I mean, money back then. You, we, we've well, got all back. Sure. We've got it all back. Give the foreign wind donate energy donate companies the money back too. If they're declaring. I think we've had enough squabbling tonight and what we need to focus on is what does your community want? for your region. Unfortunately, we've got a lot of people that are telling you what you want and there's very little actual community consultation that goes on. North so Queensland I'd love State to see and more coal mining. Queensland. That's what no, we want. Provided with okay. better interest rate okay. no But I don't Sorry, support folks. a separate state. I'm going to have to interrupt you there because all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel, Bob Catter, Cathy O'Toole, Pauline Hanson, George Christensen and Larissa Waters. Thank you very much. Now you can continue the discussion with Q&A Extra on News Radio and Facebook Live, where Tracy Holmes is joined by the director of the New Democracy Foundation, Ian Walker. Next Monday, Q&A will be joined by the new Minister for Defence Industry, Steve Chobo, Labor frontbencher, Anthony Albanese, influential Conservative broadcaster, Alan Jones, Sunday Telly and Herald Sun National Political Editor, Annika Schmedhurst, and People's Panellist, uh, Elle Marie White, a Queensland migrant, full-time student and mother who wants a better future. Until next week, good night.